Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, in this video, we're gonna be talking about dictionary-based text analysis. So you may be interested in taking some of my classes, some of these videos, because you're interested in the latest and the greatest automated text analysis technique. Maybe you're interested in word embeddings, maybe you're interested in topic modeling, maybe you're interested in text networks. Um, but I'm gonna to try to make a case in this video that a lot of people can be well served by something called dictionary-based analysis. Dictionary-based analysis is essentially sophisticated forms of word counting associated with a known lexicon or group of words that carry some type of meaning. Let's look at an example. First, let's read in some of the tweets from President Trump that we collected in a previous video. Um, so you'd wanna check out my video on APIs if you haven't done that already. And um, you'll see we're re reading in the data and we're using some tidy text, which we learned about in the basic text video, um, to unnest the tokens. That means create a data set where each row is a unique word within that Trump tweets data frame. Now, if you remember from our basic text analysis class, it's also commonplace to drop stop words, words like and, the, and but. We're also in this dplyr code here, dropping some fairly meaningless words associated with Twitter or tweets like RT, which stands for, for retweet, or HTTPS, t.co, AMP, and so on and so forth. And now we're just trying to count the top words. We've created a new data frame in this chunk of dplyr code here called top words. So let's take a look at it. Here we're using ggplot, we're slicing that data frame, which has been sorted so that the top or most frequent words are at the top of the data frame. That slice function is slicing off the first 20. Then we're using some ggplot, ordering it um, according to frequency um, and creating a bar graph and using various aesthetics to come up with something like this. So if we look at these you know, words, we can start to see things that are recognizable as President Trump's voice on Twitter, right? We can see words like president, news, people, fake, country, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, that's one way to count words. Um, and once we look at the top words, we can start to get a sense of what's going on in a corpus. But in most dictionary-based analyses, we want to use both common words and unusual words to try to guide our intuition about how we might want to group words into categories. At first in this video, I'm going to show you how to create your own dictionaries. And that's why we're going over some of these tools for just kind of browsing your data. Um, but shortly, we're going to get into other people's dictionaries, which are often developed through empirical observation of people or other more rigorous um, coding techniques. So one way to get at the kind of unusual words in a corpus, remember a corpus is just a group of documents, a data set, it's a kind of object that we talk about um, in the field of natural language processing that contains both text and then often some kind of matrix representation of a text. And the term frequency inverse documents frequency is simply the log of the document frequency divided by the number of documents um, and um, in which a term appears. So here what you're seeing is essentially um, how much, how unusual that term is um, within and between documents, yeah? So this is how you calculate the so-called TFIDF within the corpus of Trump tweets. Once again, we're on nesting tokens using tidy text. Once again, we're removing stop words. And this time we're using the bind underscore TF underscore IDF function to sort the top words by their term frequency inverse document frequency. So remember, this is gonna to try to single out the words that are rare and kind of concentrated and add meaning um, by virtue of being kind of um, in, a, in a small group of documents. So here we see that with our TFIDF of the Trump tweets, we get a pretty understandable or interpretable, interpretable result. Um, the term with the top TFIDF in our corpus of Trump tweets is stand for your anthem. Now, if you remember, this happened early in Trump's presidency. Um, NFL players were kneeling before the national anthem and there was a large controversy about this. 
So even though Trump may use words like president, fake news, and things like that all the time, um, Stand for Your Anthem is showing that there's this kind of concentration of unusual words that are kind of defining, in this case, an event. Um, and we're gonna use that kind of signal in future lectures, especially when we get into topic modeling and text networks, to try to kind of downrank really popular words and uprank some rare words that, really think, that we really think kind of add meaning to an interpretation of a text. Okay, so that's how you kind of explore your corpus a little bit. That So far we've just kind of been building on some skills I introduced in my basic text analysis video. Um, but in this one we're gonna talk about creating your own dictionary next. So suppose we had our Trump tweets and suppose we wanted to search out tweets that were about the economy. Suppose a computational social scientist wants to look at the performativity of Trump tweets. So for example, if Trump talks about the economy, does that have some kind of impact on the stock market? Obviously the causal relationship there is pretty fraught, but as a for instance, let's see it through. The first thing we might do is come up with a list of words associated with the economy or economics. Now probably that list would probably be, I don't know, 50, 100 words more, maybe more, and we'd use some sampling strategy of pulling a random set of tweets and then coding manually whether they're about the economy or not, and then we'd count the frequency of words in those uh, documents that were coded as being about the economy. But for now, suppose we've done all that, and suppose our list is much longer than this kind of short character vector I've got here called economic dictionary. Now all we would need to do to apply this to our corpus and kind of subset or pull out any tweets that are about the economy is uh, to use the string R package, which is an excellent package for string pattern recognition and string replacement and subsetting data sets by patterns and strings. You'll remember grep from a previous video. Um, and here we see um, when we apply our economic dictionary to that Trump tweets data set, uh, creating a new data frame called economic underscore tweets. Here we're looking at just the first two rows of that data set. You can see they're very clearly about economics. The first one is about trade with Argentina and the second one is about trade negotiations with China. So obviously the real work here is you, as the expert social scientist, coming up with a meaningful dictionary or lexicon that captures the types of things that you wanna see in the text. Most of the other techniques we're gonna learn about in this class, uh, uh, topic models, word embeddings, um, text networks, um, they all kind of let the computer do the deciding for you, let the algorithm um, do the deciding for you, and sometimes we call that an unsupervised algorithm. Um, but here, you know, if you really are an expert and if you really have insight, uh, a dictionary method can be perf perfectly reasonable, provided you can uh, give a good explanation of why your dictionary contains the words that it does. Another really kind of popular kind of dictionary-based analysis is what's known as sentiment analysis. And here, essentially what we do is uh, various research teams create a list of words associated with different sentiments. Then we count the number, the rate at which those words appear in a document. And then we can kind of globally say, okay, well, a document here is 11% negative and 89% positive. So there's, as you might imagine, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, you know, you can choose a lot of different words to be either negative or positive. And of course, you can also code all different types of sentiment instead of just positive and negative. For example, you could include fear or anger or joy and try to differentiate those even more clearly. Um, but let's take a look at a relatively simple sentiment dictionary from the computer scientist Bing Liu. So here in tidy text, we're calling the get underscore sentiments function. Um, there's a sentiment dictionary called Bing, and here you can see here, these are the first six words that appear in that dictionary, and the word is in the first column, and the sentiment is in the second column. So you can see here we have a whole lot of negative words early on in this dictionary here. And so essentially once we have a list of negative words, we can do various kinds of dplyr style joins to, in this case, uh, count the number of negative tweets by President Trump. And so we can kind of globally count the number of um, different uh, you know, categories, positive or negative, by you know, individual tweet, or maybe more interestingly, by time. 
Now, this is a kind of small footnote. If you've not yet worked with date objects before, it's worth listening up for just a little bit. So if you don't know already, kind of each date in, in most text data has a timestamp. Now, time can be represented in a lot of different ways. Sometimes we might just list the time of day and the minutes. Sometimes we might list the month, the time of day, seconds, a time zone, and sometimes we may spell the, the month completely and other times we may abbreviate it. And so essentially, um, because of this complexity and also because of time zones, which kind of wreak havoc on computing in general, um, computer scientists long ago created a standard called Unix time. Unix time is simply the number of seconds that have elapsed since January 1st, 1970. And so any date, regardless of its uh, uh, time zone, can be reformatted as Unix time. And so in R, there's a number of functions that do this. In base R, you can use the one here, is.date. There's also another popular package called Lubridate. But essentially what these do is identify kind of patterns in the text. So you have to tell it here, where is the year and is it separated by a dash or a slash or whatever. Um, and you need to read through the documentation, of course, to learn how to represent different forms of year and months and date kind of da data. Um, but once you do that, you're essentially converting it to Unix time and then it's highly portable and you can pull out from that anything you want, month, year, date, seconds, and so on and so forth. So we wanna do that so that we can plot our sentiment of Trump tweets over time. So in this chunk of dplyr, we're simply using an inner join, another kind of dplyr join, um, and filtering um, the, uh, the join, which we're joining the Trumps with the sentiment, uh, sorry, the Trump tweets with the sentiment dictionary, then we're counting them, and then we're, we're kind of dropping everything that's not negative, and then we're counting the number of negative tweets by day. Again, we can plot this with some ggplot. Here we're using a line graph. Um, we have some aesthetics again, and we're simply plotting the number of negative tweets by day. And we see something that looks like this with a simple line graph, or if we want to smooth it, something like this. Okay, so you know here a key consideration with sentiment analysis, and really all forms of sentiment analysis, and you might be wondering this already, is well, who gets to decide what's positive and negative? Well, the answer is lots of people do it in very different ways. And um, what you really need to get your head around is how the person who created the dictionary was thinking about sentiment and whether that maps on to what you wanna do. So for example, in the case of Bing Liu, a lot of these um, uh, codes in his sentiment dictionary were created uh, through review data, things like Amazon data, IMDB data, um, and, or Yelp data, yeah. So as you can imagine, that might be okay if you wanna say, determine the sentiment of a restaurant review, but does that really capture something like sarcasm in a president's tweet? Those are the kind of things that are really tricky to measure and might, um, might be beyond the pale of a sentiment analysis. But at the very least, hopefully it's given you the intuition that when you choose a sentiment dictionary, you wanna choose one that's been created in a process that is justifiably similar to the one that you wanna measure. An alternative, um, which has become popular over the last few decades, is linguistic inquiry word count. This is a tool that was developed by a social psychologist named James Pennybaker. And Pennybaker had an interesting intuition. He's a social psychologist, and while many of his colleagues throughout the 90s were developing increasingly rigorous kinds of survey measurements of psychometrics, Pennybaker thought, well, why can't we look at text and pull out some of those psychometrics from text? Psychometrics are kind of measures of various psychological, emotional, cognitive states. And so what he did with a team over many, many years is rigorously code um, the entire English dictionary and then supplement that um, with a lot of observation of human behavior, especially people writing, and then develop weights for virtually every word in the English language and in different types of English language. Uh, so for example, in newspapers and on blogs and even now on social media to come up with this, a very long list of codes um, that, that really are kind of, uh, they're kind of all over the place. I mean, it captures things like negative or positive sentiment. It disaggregates them by fear and anger and this type of thing. It also includes codes for kind of mental processes. So cognition, rationality, insight, causality, 
Um, and this has become a popular tool in large part because it was so carefully constructed through empirical observation and rigorous, rigorous intercoder reliability in the development of the dictionaries. And so this is why it's been used in a lot of high profile papers, such as the Kramer et al. emotional uh, contagion experiment. And I've linked to one of my own papers here that used it. And I'll say in general, it's a, I think a high quality tool, but like any sentiment dictionary, it's only as good as the observation and development process of the dictionary itself. And so Luke or any other uh, sentiment dictionary will really struggle to capture the subtleties of language. And you'll always, always, always deal with some false positives and some false negatives. In other words, sometimes Luke will tell you there's emotions where there aren't emotions there, and sometimes it will fail to detect emotions. And that can be anything because of the, from the you know, complexities of natural language usage to simply misunderstanding how a word, uh, word's meaning can be altered by its presence around other words. Now, when we get into topic modeling, text nets, and word embeddings, we're gonna to try to take better advantage of the co-presence of words to estimate things like topics. Um, but that'll carry other kinds of problems too. So if you're trying to figure out whether sentiment analysis is for you or which sentiment analysis is for you, um, take a look at this interesting paper which compares a lot of different sentiment methods. So here is uh, various sentiment algorithms or dictionaries applied to different types of events on Twitter. And as you can see, they're picking up different amounts of emotion in these events. So at, at a kind of general level, they're measuring very different things. Um, we can also kind of rank them in terms of comparing them to a ground truth. We can say, well, uh, Luke, um, you know, did really well 80% of the time and Vader, which is another popular sentiment library in Python, did very well a lot of the time. And there's dozens and dozens of others. But really the take home message that I'd like you to, to get is that different sentiment dictionaries perform well in different types of contexts. So here in this same paper by Gonsalves et al, you can see there is a ground truth. That means uh, a set of, of uh, coding done by humans uh, to kind of determine whether or not a text was including a positive or a negative emotion in this case. And across the x-axis, there's different types of corpuses. So there's you know Reddit, YouTube, the BBC, and other kind of large you know, um, text-based data sets. And you can see that no single uh, algorithm, the, the lines kind of going across this graph here, performs perfectly. And some of them perform better on certain types of data than others. So if you wanna get into sentiment analysis, I recommend giving this paper a quick, uh, quick read and thinking again a lot about how someone else's dictionary might map onto your theoretical and methodological needs. So when should you use dictionary-based analysis? Well, there's gonna be a lot of cases. If you feel like you know what you're looking for in text really concretely, um, and you can come up with a list of words, um, very often that's gonna perform better than a lot of the unsupervised models that we're gonna look at. Um, if, on the other hand, you're getting into a text analysis for the first time, and it's kind of more of an exploratory endeavor, um, the unsupervised methods might be useful in helping you get a sense of the lay of the land, what types of themes are in the text more broadly. And you may then wanna come back in with a dictionary analysis or some kind of hybrid measure, maybe a supervised model where you pass some codes to an algorithm and then the algorithm kind of learns the distribution of words across the themes that you wanna pick up and then um, analyzes them um, on its own um, using that so-called training data. So um, the big picture is dictionary analysis is often kind of, you know, poo-pooed um, for being simplistic. Um, but really, when you get right down to it, it can be a powerful tool.